Hello, our six, seven, eight students. I'm coming to you from my humble abode here in Bloomington, Indiana on the south side somewhere. Uh, maybe I'll find it someday. Maybe you'll have to show me uh, your work, your papers sometime, drop them off. Like my students used to do. No one comes here anymore. Wonder why? Oh, the coronavirus. Hmm, indeed. Ah, uh, so social media is being used a lot during the coronavirus. I'm undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, yes. Uh, and indeed, you are using Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and WeChat and Kakao Talk and Line and Facebook, LinkedIn, Academia.edu, uh, ResearchGate. I use most of those tools. I haven't used TikTok yet or Instagram yet or WhatsApp, but uh, the rest I do enjoy once in a while. I probably should pan around a little bit before we get started here. Those take a look at that. Uh, my heater's not working, so I can't use it right now. But anyways, we have beer goes in the back in the bottom. But uh, the lighting's not good going that way, so we'll go this way today. And let me again uh, welcome you to oh, week 11's finale, uh, the final thing, uh, research on social media, which I put together a year and a half ago for the conference called Ed Media in Amsterdam. My assistant, Mena Ju, and I put together a set of research findings and I kind of summarized them um, for the conference. And I was given 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. I will talk longer than 10 or 15 minutes right now, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it won't take too long. There is a lot of stuff, so go to Dropbox and drop those files down and look at them and, and maybe find the articles and read them. One or two of them were assigned for this week. Anyways, they're open access. The rest are not. But if you need the articles themselves, let me know. I should have them somewhere. So let me try to, to find the file. And by the way, we're going to go through Twitter and Facebook are two of the primary research um, tools that were investigated. What's uh, a couple of um, news group kinds of things. Let me see if I can share my screen and call up my slides and see what they look like. Oh, that's, that's the end of my slides right there. And so let's see if we can go back up to the very, 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 very beginning of them. And there we have it. And so social media use for learning and development. You too can learn and develop. And again, my assistant, Mena Ju, co-created these slides with me. I didn't invite her here to present them because I think she needs to, to uh, stay indoors. She's up in Detroit at Wayne State. So how many of you posted to a social media account of some type this weekend? at some point, maybe in the past hour. Uh, how many since this morning have been in, in social media? I know a lot of you use them constantly because you're sending me notes on all sorts of things. Remember where I talked about fidgetal students Whoa, three, four, 10 weeks ago? Fidgetal, I'm highly fidgetal, my son says. <laughs> I guess I would fit in. Um, I wish I was a teenager today and could exhibit my fidgetal skills and go back through all that. Wouldn't have to be an accountant. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, today things are changing and relying more on informal learning and uh, learning outside of classroom pursuits, whether you're reading a blog about the changing earth uh, that uh, Aaron Daring put together and his colleague Charlie Miller will be our guest Monday night. Uh, how many of you have a Twitter account? Uh -huh. How many of you read my Twitter account, Traveling Edman? So some of you are posting all the time to Twitter. And there's research on the it's, uh, Twitter usage that will come to at the end of this talk. You know, we can be 
twittering like Aaron at the North Pole or in Northern Greenland or Northern Canada while his class is uh, having final exams back in, in Minnesota and so forth. Um, all sorts of Twitter posts. And then we've got the fake news and And I forgot um, to stop sharing for a second. I forgot to um, share and share my audio and video, but I don't have any videos. So I'm going to um, optimize sound and we'll play that one again. Let's see if you can hear this this time. CNN and MSNBC are fake news, fake news. News. How many subscribe to that Twitter account? How many read it on a ever-present daily, every minute basis? The dishonest media did not explain that I called the fake news the enemy of the people. The fake news. Well, what are we going to do about the fake news? Um, there is a problem out there with fake news, in fact. Have you heard of hoaxy? Hoaxy is a tool developed at Indiana University to deal with that. So we could help us understand or flag information that is not coming from reputable sources. Developed right here at hoaxy.iuni.iu.edu. I think it had a new handle uh, since then. It's gotten really popular. It's gotten a lot of media attention. So there are IU researchers trying to help in this world in terms of finding this coronavirus solution to you know, find a solution for the uh, illegitimate or fake news that's out there, uh, the corruption that happens. I use making a dent, um, uh, doing some on. There's the professor who's trying to help in that regard. Uh, and you can read up about it. Uh, and they're developing a whole series of tools to uh, deal with um, the bots that are providing the, the the inaccurate information during uh, political elections and for many other things. So let's not go on to, to social media for education uses, uses, and in particular, talk about the researches that are happening out there. There's so much research that's happening that you sometimes need to have what's called a meta-analysis or summary of what's going on. And I'm gonna check my timer at 7.18. Just don't wanna go too long uh sunday night here seven uh, i'm gonna lose the sunlight sun's still up for a bit but we'll see um so my friend Faye, there in the middle has done a study and she's at um i think university of toledo she was my mentee for a while Faye gal and her colleague uh jong at the bottom she's i've written two books or i've written one book with her i edited the recent MOOCs book with her at Wayne State. They studied Tweeting for Learning, a critical analysis of research on microblogging in education published between 2008 and 2011. Um, some of their original research I'll be summarizing, but they did a meta-analysis or systematic review of the research. The top article, The Role of Social Media in Higher Ed, um, a literature review in Computers and Human Behavior. Again, a summary of the literature. I'm currently working on a special issue of a journal of education technology research and development, ETRD, on systematic reviews of the research on emerging learning technologies. Just today, in fact, I was working on one piece for that, um, editing a lot of stuff. So, my friend Nada DeBaugh and her colleague Anastasia Kitsantis. Uh, had an article in, in Internet and Higher Ed in 2012, Personal Learning Environments, Social Media and Self-Regulated Learning. And what they were trying to look at is how can we help students? What are the levels of social media use or digital uh, scholarship, if you will? And they found that there, there, there in fact are things that people could do at pretty low level as an instructor to help your students into uh, the use of social media whether it's blogs or wikis or Twitter or some other thing to, to help regulate their learning, to help them guide their learning goal setting and planning. At level two, 
instructors should encourage students to use social media to engage in sharing and collaboration. And at level three, they should encourage them to aggregate and manage their information um, to synthesize across information sources. So first, just to take it up, try it out. Second, to share what you've done. And third, to aggregate all the stuff together. And then they, and by the way, again, if you could download these slides, you'd be able to read these fine prints, but from moving to having a blog, encouraging your students to have a blog, have an assignment with it or a wiki or a Google calendar or um, to use Flickr or YouTube or some other um, sites. And then later on, besides just using these tools, uh, encourage them to, to make some bookmarks, but go to level two um, to have them have comments on them, make it interactive on their blog, um, have uh, them make it interactive on their calendar. And on to level three, instructor demonstrates how to configure a blog to pull information in from multiple blogs and how the RSS feed aggregator of some kind. So uh, aggregating media and so forth. So level one, two, and three. My another mentee of mine, Bei Wen Chen, and the University of Central Florida worked with Thomas Breyer and looked at uh, administrators, um, eight U.S. United States public administration. In, uh, I shouldn't say administrators, public administration instructors for their social media practices. And she found informal use of social media could, be, could be facilitated by those instructors into formal learning environments for engaging discussions, increased uh, enriched discussions, engagement and, and connections. And she had some advices as a result of the research that they did, more qualitative kinds of research. It got published in IRR ODL, which published many articles for us this semester that you've read. And so her advice includes using social media to facilitate informal uh, discussions with somewhat clear instructional goals, using social media as an optional tool outside of class, provide students with alternative assignments if they choose not to participate. So don't require it, make it an option among many, many opportunities. Educate students in uh, privacy issues and security issues. Implement policies to use social media in an educational environment in light of security, especially today with Zoom not being secure. I'm not inviting you in here so people can't steal your information. It's just me. They'll probably bot me and put me in all sorts of things. Um, I'm not too worried about uh, the Zoom security issues right now because I really doubt many uh, uh, what do you call it? criminals are going to come in and want to join this class. But if they do, maybe they'll learn something. Um, should they, two more things. They said, understand the focus of social media activity for some faculty is um, the learner's personal interest and preferences, not a requirement. So some faculty look at social media use to be optional, not required. Others have it as required. And then have students reflect on their use of it um, and give them feedback on it. Uh, Jin Mao, who I don't know in Computers and Human Behavior, she investigated high school students' use of social media and looked at their obstacles and challenges and their beliefs and attitudes. And for the most part, uh, social media in high school was sporadic, but that was 2014, six years ago. Uh, uses by the students on their own seems to be abundant but incidental and informal, not formal, not um, purposeful in terms of their learning. Students depend on social media for their lives, but instructors do not. Students are very positive, but about their everyday life, not about their school life. Facebook research, I had a, a, a a guest in this class about eight, nine years ago, this guy right here, Raul Junco, uh, Raynal Junco. He's been looking at Twitter and Facebook both, but in the Computers and Education Journal, very high level journal, he looked at what features you were using in Facebook and what things they were doing in Facebook. They were not doing games, 
Um, they were not posting videos back in 2011, this was. They were just uh, checking up on events and chat and commenting and that kind of thing. But he went further than that. He looked at Facebook use and grades. He looked at Facebook use and engagement of 2,368 instructors. This is a, of college students. <laughs> this is a big study, okay? And so the results indicated that Facebook use was negatively negatively for all of you all you facebook people twitter people using social media may not have a positive impact on your engagement in the class it may not have a positive impact on your grades in particular as a freshman sophomore or junior in college seniors it didn't affect so much a little smarter up here they were more focused on getting a job they weren't off like these Kids start today during the coronavirus having a big old party somewhere or sitting at the beach in Florida. Duh! A couple fresh, a couple freshmen, a lot of freshmen, sophomores, and maybe some juniors need to get their brain examined. But, anyways, Facebook was negatively pr uh, predictive of engagement in the class and positive predictive of co curricular outside of class activities. And he had another study the same year and it got published in Computers in Human Behavior. Pretty much all these studies are what's called, S, uh, all these journals are SSCI journals, high level journals. And so, you know, he found in the second study, and, and he was great, by the way, when we brought him into uh, to the class, we could ask him questions about anything, anything. And we put up his quotes from his articles, his slides and so forth. Uh, he was at Harvard at the time, went off to Iowa State, I believe. I'm not sure if he's still there. I think he moved on from there too. Time spent on Facebook was strongly and significantly negative, negatively correlated with GPA. How many of us are informing the freshmen and sophomores and juniors of that? Would they care? They'll just go off to the beach during the coronavirus. Uh, maybe they'll be, uh, yeah. So, Participation in Facebook is not necessarily a good thing. At least it wasn't back in 2011. I'm not sure if it changed all that much. Uh, while only weekly related to time spent preparing for class. So, you know, Facebook wasn't that, uh, that relevant for, the, for their full investment within the class. Facebook for collecting and sharing information, though, however, was positively predictive of, um, the outcome variables while using Facebook for socializing was negatively predictive. So it depended. So while I, while I criticized Facebook, it depended on how you're using Facebook. If it's for social things, forget about it. It ain't gonna help. If it's for collecting and storing and sharing, like kind of what I do, I share a lot of posts, a lot of news and a lot of resor resources and research. It's positively predictive. So as, as, everything it is in education, the ultimate answer is what? What's the ultimate answer? It depends. Don't take anything that I say um, as cut and dry, this is the way it is. Nothing is like that at all. All, all education is kind of fuzzy. You have a little more tendency towards something uh, than towards something else. But don't overgeneralize one study. Even don't overgeneralize 20 studies in terms of one outcome measure because some outcome measures may be influenced by secondary variables. I won't get into all that, but let's just say these, this research can tell us something, but it's not, it's, the case is not closed anyhow. So Ray did another study, 2015, Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology. Another good journal. Guys post is in top journals. Student class standing, Facebook use, and academic performance. So what did he find? Well, like I said, the seniors spent significantly less time in Facebook. Why? Because they got to make up for the whole time they, they missed out in the previous years not studying. They were making up, like my son, making up for his GPA in the final year. Or maybe they, they got a significant other as a partner and they wanted to impress them and get a job when they graduate. Or maybe their parents or pulling the plug on their funding if they didn't spend more time, or maybe they matured a little bit. Maybe they thought about life. So uh, yeah, the seniors spent significantly less time multitasking with Facebook than other ranks. 
time spent on Facebook was negatively predictive of GPA for freshmen. Duh! But not for other students. Multitasking with Facebook was significantly negatively predictive of GPA for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, but not seniors. So time, multitasking, socializing, Ray's shown it all. And he's got some charts to show you all classroom standing and frequency of chatting in Facebook and time spent in Facebook and frequency of commenting. You know, this data, often it's computer log data, but it's, it's you're talking about thousands of posts, right? A lot of stuff. Well, on to Twitter, right? The Ray's doing that too. <laughs> of course, we, we covered a little bit of Twitter earlier. Uh, so Twitter. 125 students taking a first year seminar in, in, in this 2011 journal, Computer Assisted Lear Learning, uh, another SSCI journal. So pre-health professionals, Twitter was used for co-curricular discussions. Engagement was me measured by the National Survey of Student Engagement, which was developed by George Koo at Indiana University. The experimental group had a significantly greater increase in engagement than the control group, as well as higher semester grade point averages. So students who are using Twitter were more engaged and got higher GPA, unlike the Facebook studies. This study shows some evidence Twitter can be used as an educational tool and to engage learners and mobilize faculty into more active participatory learning. Remember this week is on active participatory learning. Twitter, yes, Facebook, no, but there's not. We're gonna show some studies of Twitter, no. And of course there are some studies of Facebook, yes. And so you, when you collect all this data, you can get, you know, as, as you, you see here in the, the bar graph on the right-hand side, you see the changes in Twitter use during the semester. You see the, on the, right -hand, on the left hand side, the experimental group in four different sections, how many times they were Twittering and what their GPA was at the end of the semester. And you can, there was an impact for the experimental group. Now that's not a lot, we're talking 125. So, you know, it's, it's not a lot. So he did, he did another study, a uh, second study with 135 students. Twitter was voluntary. Whereas the first study, Twitter required by half of the class and not required by the other half of the class. So that was, that was published in the British Journal of EdTech, another great journal, putting Twitter to the test, assessing outcomes for student collaboration, engagement, and success. Qualitative analysis of tweets and quantitative outcomes show that faculty participation on the platform, integration of Twitter into the course based on theoretically driven models and requiring students to use Twitter are essential. So you have to make it required and you have to purposely use it within a theoretical framework or a model. Don't just randomly decide to use Twitter, have a purpose behind using it and build that into your course. That's just common sense. Thoughtful integration of technology is what works. And that's what basically what he's saying here. You have to thoughtfully integrate based on your outcomes, your expected outcomes, your your, your um, predicted outcomes, uh, your goals and objectives, in effect. In a business and management course at 252 students in Chris Evans' course, Twitter for teaching, can social media be used to enhance learning? In this case, Twitter usage didn't impact class uh, attendance. However, positive correlation between Twitter usage and student engagement in university activities. Uh, including organizing their social lives and sharing information. So undergrads took this 12 week course and there was some positive impact on not only um, in, in organizing their daily lives, but also in their attitudes and experiences. Uh, but it wasn't related to interpersonal relationships between the students and their instructor. Shui and Ching in mobile microblogging. Microblogging is basically using Twitter, a short post. Using Twitter and mobile devices in online courses promotes uh, to promote authentic learning. Well, 
here we've got 16 students, it's not a big study, using Twitter on their mobile devices to share, collect, comment on information and trying to figure out how best to utilize that in, in a graduate course in instructional design, message design to impact the learning. Students had positive perceptions again about this. Uh, they were inspired by their peers who shared their comments and ideas and what they found in their Twitter feeds was inspiring. Uh, they were able to generate information through social tweets about their own personal lives and experiences. And they were more engaged in relevant activities through Twitter. So Twitter again had positive impact on the classroom setting to create authentic, engaging, and rich learning environment. And if you look at the study further and go to table one, in terms of the categories of the tweets, category one is about assignment relevant things or assignment relevant uh, replies to a tweet or um, social tweets um, uh, related to the assignment or not related to assignment or resource sharing and so forth. And the, the assignment relevant replies and assignment relevant uh, tweets were the most uh, abundant social tweets third and so forth so people look this it's like being a kid in a candy store oftentimes you get this rich data set you have to figure out what are the schemes to analyze the data well they most create a coding scheme to try and analyze that data most try and uh refine it down or pare it down a little bit by looking for themes or looking for categories and so forth shannon ronaldo and her friends susan tapp and deborah lavari lavari Lovely. Twitter has many benefits for marketing students. So here we got marketing education journal. I believe that's an SSCI journal. I've never published in there, but most business education journals, the primary journal will be. I once published in the Journal of Accounting Education. It took me seven years to publish in that sucker. Uh, it took a long time. Three years it sat on the editor's desk. Two years I took to revise it with my colleague. Another three years sat on the desk or something thereabouts. Twitter has many benefits for marketing uh, educators who are interested in engaging uh, students in experiential learning. That's what they found. Uh, in terms of Twitter, it's a fast and easy way to get information out to students, to address student issues to task structure with course-related course, course related assignments. Um, educators can use Twitter to generate interest in the course. So you can get information out there quickly and get them excited about the course. Um, Twitter can be used for direct communication with students to generate discussion and interest in topics. So they had three studies, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, they suggest that Twitter use with the professor and students uh, with the professor, students will feel more prepared. Um, they'll they'll feel like they've met the goals that they have set in the course. So again, positive Twitter, negative Facebook. We move on. My friend Fei Gao again, and Tian Liu, and Ka Zhang. Uh, Fei and Tian have a each have a piece in my my new special issue in ETR and D. Uh, and I'm mentored Faye a long time ago or not so long ago I was assigned to, by the AERA conference to do that and then Tian Liu I've been helping as well um so you often think a professor is you know got a set of students at a particular university and whatnot I often have them all around the world from Singapore to Finland to Australia and, and, and so forth um, not yet on the International Space Station, but in quite a few places. So in this study, Tweeting for Learning, a critical analysis of research on microblogging in education published 2008 to 2011, British Journal of EdTech. The analysis suggested that microblogging has potential to encourage participation, engagement, reflection, and collaboration. Case closed under diver different learning settings. So they looked up a ton of studies, found a Twitter, can help students actively participate, are more engaged within the classroom setting, are more reflective on what's happening, and are more team-like oriented. So, you know, what do you got to lose by trying that out? Now, they had 21 studies. Is that enough to make a cl that claim based on just 
21 studies. Well, you can say something, um, but as they said, the, the quality of the research varied quite a bit uh, in those studies. So it, it was one cut through the data to understand this phenomenon a little better. What did they have in terms of studies? They had four language learning studies, six IST kind of studies, one new media study, one two business studies, you know, and, and a couple that didn't have, tell what the discipline was. And what did people look at when they're studying microblogging or tweeting? Some look at frequency of use, just quantitative data, how many times you post or the types of posts, the categories or examples of posts. Some have survey data. That's the easiest to collect. That was 15 of those studies. And how many, how many studies was that again? 21, so 15 out of 21. One of those looked at academic grades, Ray Junko's study that we, we talked about before. And then three had something else. And Judy Dunlap and, uh, and Rosenthal um, Dunlap's at University of Colorado, Denver. They looked at uh, three other studies that stuff, other stuff. Faye Gao did more research. <laughs> In fact, I just sent Faye a paper to review for her issue because she's so good at social media. So uh, yeah, she's reviewing something for me right now. They, they had another study in 2017. So almost this other study, uh, 2012. Okay. So 2017 in the British Journal of EdTech again. That is not an easy journal to get in. They often have five reviewers and then they send it out for a second review to another five reviewers and it can be, ah, pull my hair out, you know. <laughs> British Journal of EdTech, ah, had, I had one study published in there in 2004 about um, case-based learning with teacher training. And then I've got one right now that's come out. It came out online. It's going to come out in print soon. I think I might have one in review. So I'm starting to use this one. Examining one hour synchronous chat in a microblogging based professional development community. One hour. I'm going to look at one hour of chat. Even one hour of chat is a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, sometimes you, you look at the data sets and you just kind of, how am I gonna, how am I gonna spend my life? You know, I could be, be you know, in the middle of this swamp, down this giant rabbit hole, but never come out again. Well, the purpose of this study was to understand how people interacted in a popular microblogging space, this community by looking at one hour of that space or community and, and the levels of participation, the topics generated, the types of interaction. The study found that online synchronous chat occurred among members of the Ed Chat Twitter community. It was dominated, what, what happened was dominated by a few people. They took over. <laughs> if you join that community, you're just stuck reading from one or two people and, and, and nobody else really matters because I don't have time to. I Twitter about a little bit, you know, a couple people, that's all, that's their life, you know, they get their life out of tweeting, you know. These active members not only generate a large amount of tweets, they also interacted actively with other participants. They just crazy people. There are crazy people out there. That's not, you know, they crazy people watch uh, Wikipedia and update Wikipedia so it doesn't get sabotaged. There's, there's crazy people in these news forums that make sure everyone just gets feedback. Crazy people Twitter and tweet. Uh, however, half of all members tweeted only once. The majority of members had limited connections with, with others. And there's what it looked like in that hour. <laughs> what a mess. There are tools to pull out. I was working with a guy on, from, who's that, in Montreal, he, and he was in a doubly appointed at Stanford, I think. He developed a tool for visualizing the data from one of these and, and analyzing the discussion chats and pulling out the big thick threads and so forth. But uh, they create a map of, a fake created a map. And what she found is most things were, uh, were general statements uh, in blue in the upper right. Most things, or retweets uh, green in the upper left, or were building on someone's comments. That green and the bottom were uh, Purple down below, SP is um, da, 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 uh, support statements. So supporting, building, general statements, and retweeting. That's what's happening out there. And, it, you know, it go from uh, 12 o'clock to uh, 1 o'clock, the number of, of things posted, you can see it goes up and then it goes down, 51 posts for a certain segment of four minutes and so forth. Um, 
So yeah, you can look at that. You can look at what they were, uh, they were doing, what topics, who, what, when, where, and why kind of things. Mostly how to do something, general how, uh, specific how to do something. Number two, what something is, and then why, and then some other things. So she could understand that. Well, Faye, more recently, did a follow-up to all this and exploring the relationship between online discourse and co commitment in Twitter professional communities. She looked at 600,000, let me repeat, 600,000 tweets over six years. She's crazy. She still looks kind of young. How did she find all that time? Where'd she put her kids? Get the nanny. Get the nanny again. So um, she investigated all that in the online discourse of a Twitter community, uh, generating this stuff uh, under the hashtag EdChat, okay? And so she tried to looking at the social components, the cognitive components, the interactive components using text mining messages and survival analysis, I guess. So there are text mining tools logged log the data. So she doesn't sit, sit there and code, like my dissertation coding keystrokes while students are writing. You know. The results reveal that the, you know, coding keystrokes is a boring, boring thing like being an accountant. So the results revealed that more tweets in the cognitive domain, interactive domain were, were going on than um, that the members were exposed to the, the lower risk of dropping out. So the more cognitive, the more interactive, the more likely they were engaging. The social didn't do as much as I would have expected. Tweets and their interactive dimension had a slightly stronger impact than cognitive dimension. It's not that we should forget about social, it's just they're, it's less important evidently in, in terms of tweeting. And you can look at uh, the tweet post from 2008, I guess, to 2015, in terms of those 600,000 posts and the, the tweets over time built, you know, to, to 2014, 15 and whatnot. So that's Faye Gao. Enough of Faye. We'll go on to my friend George Valencianos, our good friend, because we've been reading from George all semester. And George was supposed to be my student at Indiana and didn't come to Indiana. He stayed up in Minnesota where Charlie Miller will talk to tomorrow night, Monday night. We can ask him questions about George because they're colleagues. So George has since moved to an island, Vancouver Island. He's the distance chair of education in Canada. And Charlie, at least developed a company, you know. <laughs> what am I? I'm just sitting around here being told what I need to teach. I'm told I shouldn't teach this class because it's an elective. I should teach the required classes. Anyways, another battle for another day. I keep fighting battles. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long I can fight these battles. And by the way, I'm drinking from my Beatles love. Because I like the Beatles Love show in the Mirage at Las, in Las Vegas. Go to that show if you can. Spread the Beatles Love, sing songs. Anyways, good old George. Journal of Computer Assisted Learning, another SSCI journal. I've got an article in review there. I've never published in Journal of Computer Assisted Learning. I never thought about publishing there, actually. And now we do have one, I think. It's got it's going to be accepted. I'm hope, hope, hope. We've got ten articles in review right now. Um, I've been going crazy keeping up with my. They're keeping up with my people. My former students are writing these. I'm not. I'm just helping. They're very good. Um, study that George had was to understand scholars' naturalistic practices on Twitter, in particular. So scholars participating on Twitter, how do they share their information or, you know, resources and do they do that? And, um, you know, what about assistance that they got? Um, do they need help? Do faculty need help in learning how to Twitter and how to tweet? Uh, so, so he was analyzing uh, these, these scholars in a, in a Twitter database. Um, and he uh, sought to network and make connections uh, with, uh, do, the, do they network? Do they ask for assistance? Do they get assistance? Do they share information? What is it that's going on? And uh, so that study was 2012, um, his study of, of, of Twitter with that. I don't have anything more about that particular study. 
but he did do a follow-up in Internet and Higher Education, another SSCI journal, the editor of the journal is Vanessa Denon, my former student. And um, we're, she's working on the special issue of etr &D with me right now. Uh, so George and Royce Kimmons, I think Royce Kimmons is at Boise State. That's Royce in the bottom, George at the top. <clears throat> and George originally from Cyprus. And then he went to Minnesota and then he got a job in Manchester in the UK and then University of Texas at Austin. And I spoke to his students once or twice in Austin. And then he moved up to Canada and, and lives on an island with his wife and, you know, secluded out there in the woods where we all should be from time to time. So good old George. Uh, but he's, you know, he gets, he's at, Royal Rhodes University, which is a distance university. I don't think he teaches classes, but he may. I think he just does research. There's a lot of research. So this study examined educators, um, uh, education scholars, uh, professors and doc students in particular, um, their social media participation by mining the data. Um, so they're looking at, and he actually has a book on digital scholarship that's come out since then. I think it's free from Athabasca University. I know one of his books is free, maybe two of them are free. Uh, so he looked at uh, Twitter among 232 students, 237 professors, 74,800 hash tags, 645,000 tweets. Again, crazy man, crazy man. If he was to analyze each one himself, but he used machine coding or it's called data mining. So there, was, there are a lot of variations in how educational scholars use Twitter, a lot of variation, and it's not egalitarian at all. The, again, this notion of, of um, dominance. Some people take over and others are left behind, which is the education space as it is. Some people get supported pretty well and there's other of us that just get left behind. I could laugh now, but I wasn't yesterday or the day before. So, um, my ship has passed. <laughs> um, it to be taken up by another day. Um, so, he also found in it that um, his implications must consider the meaningful, meaningfulness of alternative metrics in determining scholarly impact that we have to think about other things besides research productivity, number of articles you produce, number of citations on one's article, there are other measures of productivity in terms of references to one's work, um, in terms of downloads of one's work, in terms of sharing of one's work, uh, other indicators of the impact that one's scholarship is having, translations of one's work suggests that by focusing on the use of social media for scholarship, researchers have only examined a fragment of online digital, uh, digital activities of academics. There's a lot more to having social presence than just using social media, uh, like Twitter. I remember one person said to me once, you're not using Twitter much, well, you, and you wrote the World is Open book. You're not, a, you know, you're not, a, you're not one of us. <laughs> Basically, if you're not a Twitter user, you're not one. How can you write a book like that? But what George is saying is that we shouldn't look at just one form of media as, indicate, as an indicator of one's scholarship in an online or digital space. There's so many other ways in which that occurs or happens. Within this study of 600,000 Twitter uh, tweets, I guess, you can look at the number of hashtags with the word ed education in it or higher ed or ed chat, real large percentage of them. On the left is the professor, on the right is student, and it varied between the two. Um, for the student, not so much in terms of um, ed tech, for instance, the, the professor side was more, was higher, uh, or um, some of the other variable, AERA, for instance, didn't appear the American Education Research Association conference and STEM on the professor side, but not on the student side. So, and then he had categories for things like promotional tweets, instructional tweets, resource tweets, um, personal 
feelings, reflections, examples, questions, gratitude, and introductions. You'll notice more pr promotional things in Twitter's happening out there. Not so much gratitude. <laughs> oh my God. Just people aren't, you know, maybe you aren't. Gratitude, thank you, thankfulness, all right? Not so much questions, right? Not, not so much examples, not introductions, but sure a, lot, a whole lot of personal feelings about how they feel and resources, that's good. Instruction, that's good. Promotional, well, it may depend. If you segment and look at, is it the learner promoting things or the institution or the, the instructor? or something else. So he, he, he looked at types of tweets through six categories. The provider, I guess that's the learning management provider or like Canvas. Um, then he looked at the instructor. So the instructor is doing instructional things, highest 34%. Resource things, 22%. Promotional, only 15. Personal feelings, 10. The institution, 33% promotional. So it's, it's the institution and the provider, 87% of what the provider's doing and, and other 45%. So the learner promotional is only 10%. The learner is 2% gratitude. And I don't see anything higher than 2% gratitude out there, uh, unfortunately. So that's in the Journal of Computing and Higher Ed, which is a good journal. SSCI, a Social Science Citation Index, maybe. So that study was 2017, and his basic takeaways from that suggest that learners did not find Twitter to be a useful space for them uh, that provided added value and responded to their needs. They just didn't find it. Uh, the, the learners didn't. The study provides little evidence to support the claim that social media can increase participation um, in the context of Twitter as, as an adjunct to MOOC. So this was a study, I, I, I'm sorry, I, this was a study of Twitter use within a MOOC. Did that get people more engaged? Do you maybe not drop out as much and all that kind of stuff? It wasn't all that successful within a MOOC. The earlier studies were done in regular classrooms, maybe online or traditional face-to-face. -face. In terms of a MOOC, not as much of an impact as much as I would have thought. It. I would have thought it have more impact in such spaces. Results demonstrate the need for greater intentionality in integrating social media into MOOCs. So you need to be per more purposeful in, in that. Um, why are you doing that? So again, little evidence to support the claim social media can increase. Future directions. More cross-cultural studies in the social media space. Do different cultures and regions of the world respond differently and, and use it, these media differently? Uh, maybe we need uh, to uh, think about um, how tools like Facebook could be used as the entire online learning platform. And then what would social media use be like if Facebook itself was the tool for, for teaching and the, and the instruction in the course? Um, we could also look at the ways uh, MOOC user participation varies across disciplines varies across social uh, media. So maybe it didn't work so well for Twitter, but what about Instagram? What about TikTok? What about WeChat? What about, and, and I think there are studies of WeChat uh, actually within MOOCs. You know, what about Kakao Talk and Line and, and, and Facebook? Uh, it'd be a considerable in interest for future studies to assess whether aspects of the learning process can be improved by Twitter and social media more generally. So can can we engage certain aspects of that learning process more so maybe um, uh, when we're getting at uh, draft and maybe draft and redraft of an article and use of Twitter during the, the early stages to, you know, um, as one builds their paper up uh, towards a midterm or a final, if you, you know, recursive process kinds of things. Um, or you might uh, use Twitter maybe for teamwork issues um, and sharing the resources within the teams. That would make a lot of sense. Maybe week one of a class within the learning process would be a tweet and week 15, the end of a class. So different aspects. So finally, future directions in general. This is from Fei Gao in terms of social media. Um, she says, we have to provide some guidance or social supports, some job aids of how to build knowledge and 
and support communities and co-construct knowledge and so forth, we need some guidance if we're gonna use social media as part of that community building. Um, we need to encourage participants to use social media for engagement over time. So um, we need more instructor purposeful support. Uh, we need to uh, develop automatic grouping mechanisms so uh, to form groups and communities within the social media when you have especially these large MOOCs. So are there ways to create collaborative teams or interest groups and then have social media that might be refined down to that specific group maybe? So it's not the whole class? I think that's what she's getting at. Uh, we need to know how to effectively combine informal and formal environments in terms of social media. And that's a given. That's, I guess that's a common thing in much of the research that we're reading in this class, especially this week on informal environments. This is probably the most relevant to this week here. How do we use the social media as a bridge from what's happening in the personal space to what can happen in formal learning environments? And then we need automatic analysis of the online discourse to understand the individual or group processes of, of meaning making or knowledge building. Automatic analysis of online discourse. And we need for social media and AI, artificial intelligence, to provide just-in-time training and learning, if possible. That's a long-term out goal, I think, maybe, but some of these are more short-term in nature. Anyhow, thank Fei Gao for this week, Tian uh, uh, Liu, and um, Ka Zhang, and Rael Junko, and George Valencianos, and Royce Kimmins, and all the others that I kind of summarized rather quickly in there. And I think that's the end of my slides. Again, uh, they're in Dropbox, they're in Dropbox. I went a little longer than what I anticipated going in here tonight. I don't even know it's eight o'clock. It's not been an hour, I don't think. And maybe you skipped around and watched some of that. Uh, maybe you didn't watch all of that. Um, so um, thanks for, for hanging in there a little bit. Uh, we're ending week 11 with this uh, short lecturette or a long lecturette, depending upon your point of view. Hopefully you learned something about the research that exists out there on social media. It mostly covered the years 2010 to 2017, 18. Again, it was two years ago when I, or a year and a half ago when I had to present uh, the summary. So this is, this is what existed at, at that time. I think it might give you some insights, especially that article that you had to read this week from Bei Wen Shen. Uh, I think it's article number eight uh, for week 11. Uh, and there may have been one other article that I summarized within there. But I, I, I do think understanding the different impacts of, of Twitter and Facebook and, and other forms of social media on one's learning is important because we're in the social media age. This is what it's like to live in the 21st century. And if you're going to be an instructor who is effective and successful in teaching in higher education, you have to at least recognize social media tools exist, if not understand how to use them as a, an instructor and build upon the learning that might be occurring informally so that you can impact them at a greater depth formally and recruit their interests recruit their passions that they've expressed through social media and you might be able to have more sustained purposeful efforts among your students and between them in the groups that they form because they get excited about seeing that content on display in the informal spaces that they are ex present in all the time and when they come to your formal space, it'll just seem like old hat to them. So they've been, in, you've been talking about this in, in the discussion forums and in other spaces all the time. Now, when you get to TikTok, I guess, what, the 15 second videos? That's a little bit shorter than this one. 
I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to learn something about that. But anyways, thanks for coming. I'll say good night to you all and give you a little. Uh, and uh, so forth. And we'll go and out the front, if we can even see back out the front. So um, my broken hot tub is here. Uh, my heater broke. <laughs> I'll say goodbye to all of you and I wish you well in week 12 role play. Pick up a role in the next couple of weeks. Week 12, week 13. Come tomorrow night, Charlie Miller, the, one of the most top 40 people in the U.S. under age 40. So he's a pretty cool guy. You're going to miss out if you don't see him and ask a question. See you tomorrow on Flipgrid, Flipgrid Monday. Bye-bye, everybody.